Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you uh, decided to join us tonight. Um, my name is Robin Stetzel and I will be teaching on the Think Before You Pink campaign. Um, some of you may know me as an oil educator and a gold leader with Young Living. Some of you may know me as just a uh, you know, friend. Some of you might know me from a career in nursing. Um, you know, however you know me, maybe you didn't know that I'm also a, a breast cancer action activist. And what that means is um, I really am passionate about getting the education and the information out to individuals about this epidemic we have going on with breast cancer. So majority of my nursing career, I was oncology nurse and I was a legal nurse consultant, a risk manager. Um, I traveled all over the country as a traveling nurse and over the many years, what I found is that, you know, this sickness industry that I worked in, we really didn't get to the underlying causes of disease. And with breast cancer specifically, um, there's, there's a lot of lack of information and lack of action being done out there. So I'm super excited that you guys are here tonight to not only hear this information because it can absolutely change the course of your life but also for you guys to, to help change somebody else's life with this, with this critical information. So we'll just get right into it. So again, Breast Cancer Action is a, was founded in 1990 by a group of women who just, you know, were simply like me, just frustrated with the lack of information about breast cancer. Um, and the founder of the Breast Cancer Action knew that um, their private medical crisis we're a part of a larger, larger, big public health emergency. And as we get into some of these statistics, breast cancer costs are in the billions for our country, and it's, it's not getting any better. Um, so for those people that are dealing with breast cancer, um, their voices really need to be heard. And a lot of these crises that are going on, uh, many people are not aware of. So Breast Cancer Action's mission is to carry the voices of people affected by breast cancer to inspire and compel the changes necessary to end this epidemic. So since 1990, Breast Cancer Action has challenged the impact of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. This is why I always do this talk during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so far, the primary effect of Breast Cancer Awareness Month is just been filling everything that you can see with a bunch of pink ribbons. And you know, it's, it's raising awareness, but I think we're all pretty much aware that these statistics are very scary out there. And despite the billions of dollars raised for the, you know, quote unquote cause, uh, you, they're, they're, it's not going to the cause. First of all, it's really not going to what's causing breast cancer. So BCA continues to question uh, just how far this has really gotten us. And they really hold these companies accountable. And they are in Congress. They are fighting for these changes because that's where we're really going to see this shift. So as we look at breast cancer statistics, we need to go through, you know, where we're at right now today. It's one in eight women who will develop breast cancer. And if you look at, you know, in the, in the 60s, it was one in 20. And in the 80s, it was one in 14. So, you know, today, now, and if you heard my talk last year, I said that breast cancer was the second leading cause of death uh, next to lung cancer, but this year it's now the number one cause of cancer death for women between 20 and 59 year old in the USA. So again, these statistics are super scary of what's going on. And I know, think of eight women right now that you know. So the stats are saying that one in eight, and if it's you know not you, it could be somebody else. If we don't learn these things that we can control, that we do have control of. So more than 41,000 women and men in the US will die from breast cancer this year alone. That's, you guys, that's one, in, one death in every 13 minutes from breast cancer. More than 260,000 women and men in the US will be diagnosed with breast cancer. And yes, men do get breast cancer as well. That's one case diagnosed every two minutes. African-American women die from breast cancer nearly 41% more than Caucasian women. And breast cancer is the leading cause of all cancer deaths for Hispanic women. So there's so much lack of focus where the research really needs to be to really make a change. And we're gonna talk about that. 
look at us worldwide. So as a country, we are leading the way at the highest rate of breast cancer risk worldwide. So these sources come from reliable sources and these are their statistics. And while they say we, they don't really know um, why these, these, you know, our country is the number one worst, um, but they believe that it's because these other countries have low screening rates, um, incomplete reporting, and you know, cancer or these, their statistics just aren't where ours are. And I, um, I don't know. I find that very, very hard to believe. But again, they don't, they don't continue to look at those underlying causes. So worldwide, um, we're looking at an estimated 1.7 million women and men that were diagnosed with breast cancer each year. And that's one case diagnosed every 19 seconds in the world. An estimated 500,000 women and men died from breast cancer around the world. That's one death every 60 seconds. And this, these stats right here, these images are taken today right off of Susan G. Komen's website. There's the link there. And then it says, you know, they're very, they're, they put this out there, but then it says, learn more about our research. And let's talk about where that research is really going. But before we talk about the research, let's take a minute to just step back a second and look at how did we even create this pink ribbon in the first place? So in the early 1990s, Charlotte Haley was super alarmed by the number of breast cancer diagnoses in her immediate family. And so what she did, she set out as her own activist and she started putting these peach, it was actually peach, it really wasn't pink. She attached peach colored ribbons to postcards and distributed them to everybody that she knew. And the postcards read, and you can see the quote there, the National Cancer Institute's annual budget is $1.8 billion. Only 5% goes for cancer prevention. Help us wake up our legislators and America by wearing this ribbon. So her outrage was over a lack of federal commitment to cancer prevention and recognizing her, her work with this in which she was really starting to get attention, Self Magazine and Estee Lauder approached her and they requested that they use their, her peach ribbon as a promotional tool during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And Alexandra Penny of Self Magazine said, Haley wanted, this is a quote from her, Haley wanted nothing to do with us. She said that we were way too commercialized and she believed that some of those things were just not in line with her philosophy. So Self and Estee Lauder consulted with their attorneys who told them they needed only to use a different color. It didn't even matter what Haley had, if she trademarked it or nothing, just pick a different color. So focus groups were, com were um, confirmed by, um, your, were um, gathered together, these focus groups, and they confirmed the pink color for the ribbon. They said that it was soothing, it was comforting, it was a quieting color, and the pink ribbon was born. So it's super devastating that the, the intention of why that peach ribbon was started in the first place um, is now lost it. And that's what we call a term called pink washing. And if you, you know, again, don't get me wrong. Like I am, there, breast cancer has come a long way in the last 30 years. There's no doubt. Activists have successfully demanded access to mammograms through insurance plans, free screening services, um, a lot of the treatments options are available now. There's being more research. Um, so people aren't doing as much radical mastectomies. Um, they're not doing, you know, some of these other very barbaric types of treatment, but it doesn't change the fact that women are getting breast cancer more and more. So however, the corporate takeover of the pink ribbon was so narrowly focused on popular attention on just awareness um, that prevention continues to be overlooked. So every year, this pink ribbon cause marketing generates hundreds of millions of dollars, and these companies use the pink ribbon, and they're making a profit from the positive association of linking their company with this worthy cause. And we call it pink washing when that pink ribbon, you know, actually the, some of the products that they're promoting are causing breast cancer in the first place. And so the pink ribbon will never get as far as we you know, need it to do to end this epidemic because the pink ribbons are really tightly bound up in, in corporate profits. They know that if they put that pink ribbon on, their sales skyrocket during the month of 
of October. And this is where we carry the voice for women that are affected by breast cancer. And I'm not saying that we don't want to support women. And a lot of people will buy something that's pink and gift it to somebody that's struggling with breast cancer because they want to show that they're supporting them. But show support a different way. Show, you, there's many other ways that you can show support. You don't even know where this money is actually going. So um, again, you know, that term pink washers, again, are just companies that claim to care about breast cancer, but make or sell products that are linked to the disease itself. Any company can use the pink ribbon on its, its products to indicate its support for breast cancer. Um, unfortunately, there is no, there's no uh, determination. You cannot tell where that money is going. There's no one responsible for checking how much money they donated. There's no one re responsible for checking which organization the money even goes to. No one is responsible for checking whether product has harmful chemicals in it that elevate the risk of breast cancer or other heart disease or health diseases. And so again, when we find the pink ribbon campaign benefits those corporations more than they actually benefit cancer, cancer patients, raising money to actually, you know, make, make a change. So next time you want to buy something that has that pink ribbon, and you think you're doing a cause, ask questions, ask them, Hey, where's this going? Where is the fund going? How much is going? If you really want to donate, just get your checkbook out and donate right to an organization like Breast Cancer Action that is actually taking action and doing things to help pre pre prevent breast cancer in the first place. So every year we have a new campaign that comes up that breast cancer is targeting a certain company. And every single year we have been successful at making change with these campaigns. So this year we are telling Ford to put the brakes on breast cancer. So we're calling them out. We're calling Ford Motor Company for pink washing while driving up their risk of breast cancer. So Ford runs what's called the Warriors in Pink. It's a program that they say is quote, dedicated to helping those touched by breast cancer. But the exhaust from Ford's vehicles increased breast cancer risks. This hypocrisy is exactly what we call pink washing. So scientists have known for decades that cancer causing agents, carcinogens, hormone disruptors in auto exhaust, such as benzene, 1,3-butadiene, um, and a whole host of other hydrocarbons that I can't even pronounce, they know that these increase risks of breast cancer. And earlier this year, Ford announced that they will almost exclusively sell SUVs and trucks in the US, vehicles with higher cancer causing emissions, and will stop selling nearly all of other passenger cars, including their 100% electric zero emission vehicles. So we need to band together and we are really, you know, go to this, go to this website, breastcanceraction.org, Ford, yes, .org, and click on that button to tell Ford to stop pink, pink washing all of the, it's there. All you have to do is fill out your information, your name, and click it, and it will, it will get sent to them. So as one of the big three automobile manufacturers in the U.S., Ford could make a huge, huge difference. Instead, Ford plans to focus on sales of higher emission SUVs and trucks in the U.S., and they're even introducing a new diesel F-150 truck. So now America's best-selling vehicle is offered with an engine that emits even more potency breast cancer causing chemicals. And it is up to us to make this shift. It is up to us. And I'm telling you since 1990 breast cancer action, any big company that they've taken on, they have made change and they have been successful. And it's because people like you are taking action. So please go there, send this letter now directly to the executives at Ford telling them the best way to show that they care about people affected by breast cancer is to make the shift to 100% zero emission vehicles. So I can't urge that enough. I appreciate you guys for going to that after this talk. Um, I do want to show a clip of a movie that I show every single month. If you've never heard from it, uh, heard about it, it's called Pink Ribbons, Inc. So turn your volume up and listen to this little clip. It's just the trailer, but I encourage you, you can get it on Netflix. Um, I believe that you even can watch it on YouTube. But here, let's just take a, a peek into what's going on with this industry and what Breast Cancer Action is really trying to fight. Are 
since our inception, we have donated over a billion and a half dollars. We do use a lot of upbeat music and we try to use a lot of words like inspiring and, and hope. If you are a breast cancer survivor, raise your hands high above your head. Can we take a step back? What is going on? We're missing something big. Raising money has become the priority regardless of the consequences. If people actually knew what was happening, they would be really pissed off. The first ribbon was salmon colored, made by a woman named Charlotte Haley. Estee Lauder came to her and said, we love your ribbon and we want to make this a symbol of breast cancer. And Charlotte said, no, that's about your bottom line. They said, well, all we have to do if we want it is to change the ribbon pink. It is hypocrisy to use carcinogens and products and at the same time be raising money for a cure. As you can see behind me, we handed out 12,000 bottles of honest tea and honest aid today. It's almost like our disease is being used for people to profit. And that's not okay. I wish they could also hear from all the women who have been through breast cancer and resent the effort to make it pretty and feminine and normal. It's not normal. It's horrible. It has to be stopped. People can finally rise up and object. They have to be aware of the lies they're being fed. We have to really take on the challenge of finding the cause and stopping. We're living, we're human beings. We're not just the little pink ribbon. When ordinary people do a simple thing, it changes the world. So that is just such a profound movie. I would encourage you to get your girlfriends together, hold a movie night, um, and even rent out, <laughs> rent out a movie theater because this information is so important. So some critical questions to ask when you are looking at that is, does any money from this purchase actually go to support breast cancer programs? If so, how much? What organization will get the money? What will they do with these funds? How do these programs turn the tide against breast cancer epidemic? Is there a cap on the amount that's donated? Has this maximum donation already been met? So there's a lot of that out there where they say, oh, they'll donate you know, $2,000, but they cap it at that. So all their sales after that, once they've met their cap, it doesn't matter. You can be buying that and you think you're, you're donating and none of your money is going anywhere but just to profit. So the other thing is, does this purchase, and I think this is the number one thing everybody should be asking, is does this purchase put you or someone you love at risk for exposure to toxins linked to breast cancer? What is the company doing to ensure that its products are not contributing to the epidemic in the first place? You can go to thinkbeforeyoupink.org or just go to Breast Cancer Action and you can download this toolkit and these little cards that you can start passing around. There's even a really great letter in there that comes at it with love when your your loved ones ask for you to donate to breast cancer and you you know you just you don't know how to tell them you know no because it's causing a problem um there's an there's a letter in there of how to respond back to them uh in a loving manner as well so that they can understand what's going on too so it's a fantastic toolkit i've used it since 2012 so i encourage you guys to download that so let's look at where does all the research money go. And this is straight from the Komen.org website. You, they've got their portfolio available for anybody to take a peek on. This is a, exactly what I grabbed right from their website. And so when you look at Susan G. Komen, less than 4% of the millions goes towards prevention. It is all for the cure, right? So we think cure. We think we're going to run for my mom. We're going to run for my daughter, we're going to run for my aunt because we're going to fight towards that cure. But for us, we're thinking, yes, we want cure. But for us, we're like, we don't want people to be getting it anymore. But that's not where the research money is going. So again, we have to focus less on uh, women getting cancer in the first place. And while I am not saying that this research on better treatment is not important. It is very important. And we know that some of the research funds that have decreased the mortality rate of breast cancer uh, by 36%. So that is all very, very important research that has to be done. But if we truly wanna make an impact, it has to start at less women 
getting breast cancer in the first place. So let's look at the breast cancer risk that they educate on. So they're less than 4% funds. They go towards prevention, and this is where they spend their money on educating people on, you know, family history. Well, you can't do anything about that. Um, if you had early menses, well, you can't do anything about that. Um, you know, if you're obese, yes, we know diet can relate to those types of things. If you drink alcohol, yes, we know that those things can be, uh, you know, prevented as well. But, you know, how about the dangers of hormone replacement therapy? And that's more and more people are being aware of that now. But how about the ionizing radiation? Let's talk about that. We're going to talk about what's going on with the mammography um, issue out there and smoking history. So only 30% of cases involve those that you just saw, those that you heard me just listed off. I'll say that again. Only 30% of the cases of breast cancer involve any of those risk factors. So how do we explain the other 70% of breast cancers that are going on out there? I believe it has everything to do with our toxic environment. So there was a really great article in Time Magazine called The Poisoning of America that really shed light on what is going on here. So the reality is we live in a toxic world. In, in April 2010, the President's Cancer Panel declared the panel was particularly concerned to find that the true burden of environmentally induced cancer has been grossly underestimated. The article went on to say the American people, even before they are born, are being bombarded continually with a myriad combinations of these dangerous cancer-causing exposures. They urge the president to use the power of his office to remove these cancer-causing agents, the carcinogens and toxins from our food, our water, our products, and our air that needlessly, needlessly increase our health care costs. And this has crippled our nation's productivity and it's devastating American lives all over. You saw those statistics. So today, less than 2% of all breast cancer research funding actually goes towards an understanding of an environmental cause of breast cancer, less than 2%. And what we're saying here is that 70% of the cause is not being addressed at all. We know also by research that uh, we know that 95% of cancers are due to diet and the accumulation of toxins, 95%. So, you know, that's the big problem here. And again, you know, they, they say that there are these toxic chemicals that are out there knowing it, they, they take this, this stand on, you know, innocent until proven guilty philosophy of the chemical regulation. So they wait until enough things happen. You remember what happened with the whole cigarette thing? Well, now, you know, now they're forced to tell people and educate people on how dangerous cigarettes are. Well, guess what? It was people like you and me that made that change happen. And now it's very well aware that we know that cancer is, is a, a risk factor to, to cigarettes. And, but many people do not know that their perfume they're putting on. They don't know that their, their you know, medications they're taking or these other things or the water that they're drinking or the food that they're eating are actually causing cancer. And so that's where that shift really has to take place is at that, at that government level as well. But it does just come down to us, right? We, we can teach our children, we can teach the people around us what better choices we're making and why. Because we want to make that shift. And it starts one person at a time. We've heard that, right? And it sounds a little cliche, but that's the only way anything has ever changed with one person making a difference. And then if we look at, so we know that 95% of all cancers are due to the environment and our lifestyle. And then what, you know, what about those genes? Because we hear, we hear that, oh gosh, if I have the BRAC1 or the BRAC2 gene, like let's just cut off our boobs and let's just do, you know, treatment anyways as a preventative. But the, new, the newest study out there, again, is looking at just because you have genes that it doesn't mean that you're doomed. So Time Magazine had this other really great article and it had an issue in there that has talked about why our DNA is not our destiny. The study shows of epigenetics, and this research is coming from Dr. Gupta, a well-known researcher, obviously a physician, reported that it is not our genes alone that are the problem. He stated that the genes load the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. So what this means that even if you do have that gene, just because you have it alone, right? It's not, it's not causing a problem. But once that gene is expressed, when that, once that gene is triggered, 
Now we've got an issue. And we know that the environment and the cancer causing chemicals are triggering the genes. And so the cool thing about the study of epigenetics is we can make this change. We can turn off our gene expression just by removing these toxic chemicals from the choices that we're making on a daily basis. So let's go through the top five exposures. So it's coming from the air, water, cosmetics, food, and household products. Chemicals in air. So right now you're probably thinking, oh great, like I have to go you know, live in a bubble <laughs> because hello, those are all the necessities in life and you don't have to go live in a, in a bubble. You just have to be aware of things that are going on in your environment. So we know that there's endocrine, endocrine disrupting chemicals in our wastewater. We know that there's organic solvents in our cleaning products. There's pesticides in our, in our water. It's polluting our water. So we'll go through some solutions here, but just know the chemicals in the air, these are the top ones. Now we've all heard that the secondhand smoke is becoming worse than Anything. It's just like you, you're you smoking yourself. Secondhand smoke um, can cause lung cancer, can cause breast cancer. We know these things now. So the other thing with cosmetics, 1,4-dioxane, phthalates, parabens, uh, all of these. When we're looking at parabens, and you know, it's, it's all about you guys becoming a label detective. It really is. Uh, you can download the Think Dirty app. It's called Think Dirty and you can scan your products to see what chemicals are in there and see if they are causing cancer um, or known to cause immunotoxicities or hormone dysfunction. But a study done um, in 2004, they tested all of the breast tumors and they found that parabens and phthalates were found in 100% of the tumors they found. So we know that this is a problem. Clean up your cosmetics. It's the biggest thing that you can do. The average woman gets exposed to 300 different chemicals before she even eats breakfast. So it is something that we control. Our, our organ, our largest organ in our body is our skin. So anything we put on our skin is inside our bloodstream within 26 seconds. So start looking at your products and making sure you're making the best choices. Our food. So we've gotten the, you know, the BPA, the phthalates right in our food. A lot of people, they think they're doing good by eating vegetables, but they're putting them in a plastic bag and shoving them in the microwave. We know that those are very, very toxic. Pesticides in our food, hormones in our food, styrene from styrofoam. The more you drink out of plastic bottles, the more your body is filling up with toxic chemicals. Our soy today is so toxic. You shouldn't have soy in your diet anywhere. There's just not a good, well, I should say there's, it's very, very hard to find a very good soy. Soy acts as phytoestrogen. So all these chemicals act, our body sees them as what we call xenoestrogen. And xenoestrogens act like bad estrogen. Breast cancer is a hormone problem, right? And so we need to get rid of these bad estrogens out of our life and start decreasing that. So here's a special focus, um, and this was one of the campaigns that Breast Cancer Action was very, very successful at, but this is part of that pink washing at its worst. And what we call this is milking cancer. So what we did is it was a, the RBGH, it's an artificial hormone, it's been developed by Monsanto, and it was sold to Eli Lilly. Um, it was given to cows to make them produce more milk. This is a real, I mean, if you can go and look at all these just very devastating uh, documentaries out there. But the RBGH, if you start seeing some milks that, that say RBH free, RBH free, guess who made that happen? Breast Cancer Action made that happen. They forced these companies to be accountable for putting these hormones in their cows and making them produce more. So research shows that milk produced from cows treated with RBGH increased the risk of breast cancer and colon cancer. Watch this. So Eli Lilly, who owns that artificial, that developed that hormone, Eli Lilly also sells breast cancer drugs, Gemzar and Avista, to reduce the risk, right? So Eli Lilly actually profited, look at that number. I mean, that is insane. Uh, that, they, they profited billions of dollars off of cancer drugs in 2017. So they created 
and sold a product that was known to cause breast cancer and they knew it, it's their research, and then they created a drug to go ahead and treat it once people got it. And that's what we call a circle of profit. And again, we, we did a campaign that was directed towards certain milk companies and Breast Cancer Action won. They made the change. So you guys, your voices can make a huge difference. And just knowing to, if you are drinking milk, just please check to see what types of milk you're drinking. So our household products. The number one thing that you can do to decrease your exposure immediately is to green your home. Get rid of the toxic cleaning products. We know that they're linked to leukemia, lymphoma, all kinds of cancers, not just breast cancer. So I love Young Living. I love that company. It's one of my favorite. I use Thieves Household Cleaner for every single one of my products. And research does show that just by removing toxic chemicals in your life, that even as, as a matter of three days, your blood levels of toxic chemicals can come down. So it makes a big difference. So if we think about our body as a bucket or a pond, anytime we are in contact with these toxins, our body fills up. And when yes, we have a detox pathway, we have a liver, we have a kidney, and our body should be able to take those toxins in and eliminate them. But the problem happens is when we're being bombarded with too many toxins, too many chemicals and the out the inflow is greater than the outflow and then the immune system doesn't know what to do with it and it starts creating cancer cells so you've got to start not and this is not about being 100 percent perfect it's about getting to the minimum possible and then you know for me i detox one or two times a year because even though i try to do my best you know, I'm not always perfect either. And so you just want to make sure that you're knowing that this is, is why people detox and taking your health, you know, into your own hands, your family's health into your own hands and being more, you know, playing on the offense. I always say that play on the offense, not the defense. What does your family's health playbook look like? What are you doing on a daily basis? Don't live in the defense and just wait for things, these things to pop up. We know with those statistics, we can prevent these things. So top five exposures, we just talked about air, water, cosmetics, food, and household products. So just start somewhere. Start with something. Maybe your laundry soap. Maybe your you know, uh, dryer sheets. Sw switch those out. Attend one of my other classes where we actually go through each one of these, and we're going to give you solutions for that. But just start making a change, and it can make a big difference. So let's just take a second here and talk about our current screening methods of um, you know, what we're doing for, for breast cancer. And, and to, are, are they actually working? And we're talking about mammograms here. And are these effective? Are they working? And do we have a choice here? So again, I should just put this disclaimer back out there. I am a nurse, I'm not a doctor. I'm not telling you to stop medications, do this, do that. This is for educational purposes only. And you always do want to consult with your physician. That being said, if your physician is not one that is in line with the, the belief system that you have for your health and your family, you hired your doc, you can go ahead and fire that doc and find a doc that's going to go in line with your belief systems. So a word about mammograms. The problem here is that up to 30% have false negatives, um, up to 20% have false positives requiring more tests, only 90% of cancers are detected in women over 50. Only 70% of cancers are detected in women under 50, and false sense of security with negative screening. So again, if you have a negative screen, like, oh, I'm good. Well, you know what? There's 30% false negatives out there. So mammograms do not prevent breast cancer, right? So what is the whole push? Oh my gosh, go get your mammogram. It saves lives. Mammograms saves lives. And while that might, I'm not saying early detection is not important, my gosh, it is very, very important, but this is not prevention. This is not preventing you. It tells you if you have it or not. It's not preventing you. And in fact, it might be increasing your risk. The more exposure you have to these ionizing you know, radiation and all of these exposures, we know that that's increasing your risk. So I'm not telling you to not have a mammogram. I'm not telling you to have a mammogram. I'm simply stating the facts out there and having you decide you know, what that research looks like for you. There are options. You can go to breastcanceraction.org. You can print out, how do I know if a mammogram's right for me? And it's gonna take you through a questionnaire 
to help you and guide you towards the best choice that you have. I am all about, as a nurse, I am all about informed consent and making sure people know the risks versus the benefits, not just the benefits of what the hospital or you know the medical field says. You need to research both of these to really be an informed consent decision. So let's look at mammograms a little bit closer here. So again, they have a false reassurance for both patients and clinicians, even if they get that normal mammogram report. The psychological distress over false positives. There's so many false positives going on out there. Discomfort of the procedure and discomfort of additional tests. We know that that's not fun, right, ladies? I mean, I've never had a mammogram, and you know, personally, I will never have a mammogram. I'll talk, I'll talk to you about what I do do uh, for early prevention. But potential for radiation-induced cancers, we know that that's a real risk. Overdiagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ, that's the DCIS, with resultant treatment for a condition that seldom results in death in the first place. So the other stat too, by the time breast cancer is detected on a mammogram, a woman will have already had the disease for an average of six to eight years. And this is straight from the American Cancer Society. So when we look at our different options here, thermography, and while thermography, of course, is not tied into the insurance companies and big pharma, um, you know, that's, what, that's where mammograms are, thermography has a higher rate of detection. Um, unfortunately, many insurances don't cover this. And there's a whole history behind, you know, why did, why did the medical model choose mammography and GE and you guys, it's money behind it. It's, it's big money. So, but when we look at thermography, you can have active cancer cells and they, they show that they double in number every 90 days. So at 90 days, there's two cells. In one year, there's 16 cells. And these aren't for all types of breast cancers. This is just generally speaking. Two years, it's detectable with thermography at 256 cells. By the time it's eight years, it, mammogra mammographies, still, you're looking at, they're just now detecting it. Look how that doubled. Look at the cells. We know more cells, right, is not good. So when you do a, a thermography, you have the scan done. We have a thermography technician come to our office every couple months, but you can just Google thermography centers. You could probably find one in your area. If not, reach out to me. I'll help and guide you um, to find one that's, that's um, in your area. But you can see that thermography can detect it way more uh, sooner, or way earlier, way more sooner. Is that even a, <laughs> way earlier, uh, much earlier than mammography. So 40 doublings, approximately 10 years, uh, which is considered lethal at that point. So thermography is the choice that I do. That is my prevention. I will get a thermography every single year because there's no exposure of toxic chemicals to me. And again, if I have something that's there that's questionable, do I really want to be radiating it? I mean, those are just my thoughts. So what can we do to truly reduce the risk of breast cancer? And we're good on time. All right, we got 15 minutes. Again, you can download that Think Dirty app. But number one, avoid and eliminate your environmental toxins. Store your foods in glass. Never heat in plastic. Use non-toxic cleaning products. Avoid anything with the word fragrance in the label. Eat organic when possible. Change your personal care products, so use natural products. Research the company's ingredients. You can go to safecosmetics.org. You can get the app, the Think Dirty app. There's so many resources out there to make sure that you're choosing the best products for you and your family. The other thing, number three, is lowering your exposure to estrogen, so avoiding birth control and synthetic hormone replacement therapies, avoiding soy and soy products unless they're fermented. Obviously, we know the benefits of exercise. Fat cells store estrogen, so we want to make sure that we are at a healthy weight and exercise. Removing mercury fillings. We know mercury is a toxic exposure linked to all kinds of cancers. You can visit IAOMT.org for more information on a holistic dentist near you and more information on that. Detoxification and drink plenty of purified water. Get a breast exam by trained fingers and opt for a breast thermography. Search for somebody that is certified in the Mamacare method. And that's the Mamacare, Mamacare, M-A-M-M-A-C-A-R-E method. 
So number eight, breast health supplements. What kind of supplements are you taking? Are they clean? Did you look at the other ingredients? Are some of those so poor that they're actually increasing your risk for cancer? Checking your iodine levels. Ask your doctors about these things. If you don't see a natural practitioner or a doctor that offers these type of blood testing, um, you know, reach out. I'll, I'll help you. Start Googling. Start searching for these. Iodine needs to be with selenium. Uh, a really easy way to check your iodine is to just go to Walgreens or, you know, one of those stores and buy the tinctured iodine. And you're just going to paint a square on your, your forearm and it stains it. And if that stain is gone within, you know, 24 hours, you are, it, it, the quicker it's gone, the more deficient you are in iodine. We know if you just Google iodine and breast health, you're going to find tons of information. Get your vitamin D3 level checked. And just don't have them say, oh, it's fine. You need to look at that number. The blood level should be between 50 and 80. Reference range is 32 to 100. So if you are at 40, you're still low. Check those vitamin D3 levels. Taking turmeric, milk thistle on a daily basis. Making sure that you're on a good calcium source that helps eliminate those extra bad estrogens. And just overall health, we look at probiotics for good health. Healthy gut, if you don't have a healthy gut, you're a, you don't have a healthy body. Looking at things like chiropractic care. You know, our brain controls all healing and function through our spine. We know if there is pressure on the spine, those nerves that are going to our breast tissues and to our thyroid are not going to be functioning as, as well. So get to a trained corrective care physician or chiropractor that can help you out with that. Omegas, CoQ10, digestive enzymes, all of these things. Just start looking further into these for your breast health. Reducing mental stress. We know that stress can cause all kinds of heart attacks and, and ulcers, so why can't it cause cancer? We know that it can. There's research that it can. So what are you doing in the morning to start off your day? I use essential oils to help to just balance my stress levels. I use chiropractic care. I meditate. I pray. My sister is a Reiki master. We do all these things as a offensive move instead of a defensive move. So test to see what your body needs. See a holistic practitioner. Our office does all kinds of testing to see where do I need to start? What do I need? And again, you can find many holistic practitioners out there that will guide you the right way. So this concludes our talk. I know I gave you a fire hose of information, a lot of overwhelming information, um, some information that might have just shocked you, maybe it even got you angry. And I just want you to know that, you know, it, the only thing that you can do with that information is to take action. And applying the top 10 tips on prevention, attending an upcoming class, Sharing this with others is critical because, you know, my whole goal and my philosophy is that we need to change the way people are viewing and managing their health from the inside out. That's the only way we're going to make action. So please get involved. Go to bcaction.org. Uh, if you want to hold some type of a fundraiser get together, I'd be I would love to help you out with that. I am here to support you on this journey, and I thank you guys so much for visiting me tonight. Again, my name is Robin Stetzel, and you can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook at naturalnurserobin.com, and I just thank you guys so much for joining us, and good night.